Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's class. Um, there's going to be a very, very short introduction because we have a lot of material to cover. And, and uh, in terms of, of getting through the material, I'm actually uh, a little bit nervous, not because of the subject matter, because I think the subject matter is actually quite straight, straightforward when we consider it from the, uh, the perspective of God's word, but because we have some really foundational principles to lay out. And I want to make sure that we have enough time to get to all of them. So it's not an easy one to discuss. Um, certainly it has some emotional hot buttons, we'll say, but I hope that we'll be able to solidify and reinforce uh, really what is a key scriptural principle. And we'll use that principle to help us understand some difficult passages as it relates to uh, the perception of sexism. We will not be looking at some of the laws in the Old Testament, uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy. We also will not be celebrating some of the giants of female faith in scripture. Um, giants of faith and, and of leadership, um, sisters and women that did amazing things and are, and are held as giants of faith in Hebrews 11. And we're not going to critique or, or challenge the order and the function of the present ecclesial world and the way that we run our, our meetings, be it good or bad. So what we'll, we'll focus in on is the following. Let me see. There we go. This is how we'll break down the class. Sexism. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the Bible as the basis of our belief. We'll look at hierarchy in, in scripture and, and some of the types that, that are developed. We'll take a look and analyze some challenging passages, and then hopefully we'll make some, uh, some conclusions about the principle that we do uh, focus in on. So, <clears throat> Sexism. What is sexism? Um, Wikipedia definition. And there's many different definitions. I don't think necessarily we have to go to Wikipedia to understand this, but this is how uh, sexism is defined. It's pre prejudice or discrimination based on a person's sex or gender. Sexism can affect anyone, but it primarily affects women and girls. It has been linked to stereotypes and gender roles and may include the belief that one sex or gender is intrinsically superior to another. So this is how the, the definition of sexism. And one thing that I think we need to um, really come to terms with immediately is scripture does not define one uh, sex or gender as intrinsically superior to another. And there's nowhere in scripture that uh, that, that is the case. If you argue that case, I would submit to you that you, uh, you don't really understand what the, the scripture really is saying to you. Um, but nowhere does God say that men are better than women, or conversely, that women are better than men. So this is the definition that we have today uh, at hand in terms of sexism. So uh, sexism in the Bible. Um, I have a couple of quotes here that, that relate to sexism as it's perceived today. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has the following quote uh, on, their, on their website. Organized religion has always been and remains the greatest enemy of women's rights. Why do women remain second-class citizens? Why is there a religion-fostered war against women's rights? It's because the Bible is the handbook for the subjugation of women. Another quote here from 19th century feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The Bible and the church have been the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. So these are extremely strong words, and, and I, I would submit to you that they reflect the attitudes of many of the people in the Western world. And I say that very specifically. Uh, the Western world is about a billion people, and there are seven and a half billion people on the planet that view uh, just the way of life that we, we might enjoy very, very differently than we do in the Western world. We are in the Western world, so this is relevant to us, and these are why we examine some of these challenging things. Now, these views also represent the, the opinion, <clears throat> I broad brush this, the opinion of, of the modern humanist, uh, and certainly those who reject the veracity of the Bible or those who do not understand or haven't read the Bible. Um, so our culture today is dominantly secular, and uh, the thinking of today is significantly influences the way that uh, we, 
in the ecclesia of God, perceive God's word. It, it impacts the way other churches around us behave. It impacts policies and it impacts uh, political parties. So our culture, the surrounding culture that we live in has a big impact on the way we perceive things, the way we perceive injustice, the way we perceive even God's word. And this, brothers and sisters and friends, is actually really no different from the time when the Hebrews were enslaved uh, in Egypt. Uh, it's no different from the time of Babel. It's no different from the time of Daniel and his friends in Babylon, in captivity in Babylon. It's no different from the time of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry in Israel. Our society significantly affects the way we think, and it also frames the values that we have. So that's something that we really, I think, need to come to terms with. Now, in today's society, we'll talk about modern society that we're in now. Um, it's really based in humanism. Humanism is a, is a very, very strong philosophy that exists in our, in our daily life and, and around us. And Romans chapter 1, I think, describes God's view of the elevation of humans. And let's read it. Romans 1, verse 21 to 25. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And so today's culture is one of all forms of idolatry, uh, specifically self-worship. And these types of things cloud our ability to rationally view God's word and work through it uh, for what it says, understanding the, the principles and the types that God has laid out to us. And this is really the, the phenomena that exists uh, for us today. Uh, another commentary on humanism. I think there was another time in, in history that the Bible specifically records for us, and that's the time in, in Judges. And this is the, the phrase that's used in Judges 17, verse 6, and chapter 21, verse 25. It's a reminder of these days when there was no king in Israel. There was no leadership. There was no purpose. And what did people do? Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. And I think this is a terrific parallel to what we see today. Uh, not only is sexism an issue, but we have so many other issues in society, such as, as racism. I mean, we saw a summer of unrest around the Black Lives Matter movement. We have sexism, we have homophobia, uh, we have the concepts of, of goodness uh, without godliness. And there's so many of these different movements in society <clears throat> that require us to remove them, remove ourselves from them and analyze what's happening from the perspective of God. Not from our own perspective, not from our own opinion, not from our own human thinking, but how God views these things. That's very interesting. There was actually some excellent talks that uh, a variety of brothers have done on, on the issue of, around racism. And um, you know, I'm doing a talk on sexism and I'm a guy, so that's somewhat uh, challenging right from the word go. Um, but we have a couple of our, of our black brothers who have done, done excellent talks on racism, not from their own perspective, not from the humanist perspective, but from the way God describes the equality that we enjoy in Christ. So we'll take a look at that, I think, as a, as a very, very important component of how we view sexism. Um, it's imperative to view these societal shifts from God's perspective. And that's really what we need to do is understand what God's word says about these issues. Um, Paul challenges the, the, the reader of the, of the Roman, of the letter to the Romans, and, and we get the, the privilege of reading that letter that he wrote to them, uh, to challenge them to think differently. And it's funny, when, I, when you read uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, and we're talking about thinking differently, it's interesting that our company has just unleashed a new uh, tagline and motivational uh, slogan called together let's seize every opportunity think different think human and so what if uh, uh, I, I read through Romans with a smile on my face as the company that I work for is is actually espousing these very humanistic views so let's have uh, have a look at Romans chapter 12 in the first two verses 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we are to transform our minds, not through our own thinking, but rather through the thinking of God and using God's word as the framework for our opinions, not our opinions, but those that are God's. So <clears throat> tonight, I hope that we are able to renew our minds and, and analyze this question. Why does the Bible seem so sexist? So, so why is this uh, something that, that a lot of people around us say, and perhaps even we've said it ourselves? Well, before I, we go any uh, further, uh, I'm not going to also, uh, I gave that preface at the beginning of class, we're not going to examine the behavior of people. And that's something else that I think is, is we have to come to terms with, is people will act in a sexist way. People will act in a racist way. People will act in all sorts of unchristlike manners that are unacceptable under God's framework. Uh, men act badly. So do women. Uh, men have acted sinfully, and not just badly, sinfully toward women for many, many years. And, and this is not up for debate. This is true. And we have all sorts of cases where people have wrested God's word and justified terrible actions in the sense of, I am doing this according to God's word, and it's wrong. So we're not going to spend a lot of time with that, but we will examine what the Bible says about the roles of men and women. Now, why is the Bible relevant for us today? It was written some 2,000 years ago. Uh, that's the, the last book of the Bible. <clears throat> the Revelation was, was about 2,000 years ago, and much of the rest of the words predate that. So in today's um, culture that has influenced our thinking, the culture of those days influenced the way they thought. Certainly the way the structure of the Old Testament law is, uh, is very, very uh, punitive. It's very, very structured around the, the, uh, the society of that time, along with the prophets and the Psalms. It describes a way of life that's very, very foreign to our own experience and our own way of thinking. And so how do we set, uh, let such an old book that's written for a society that clearly doesn't exist today, how do we let that govern our lives? Well, that's the core consideration for our topic tonight. If we, if we do not accept the authority of God's word written in the Bible in its entirety, Frankly, we can stop the class. We, we have no discussion. So we either accept the entirety of God's word as the authority, um, or, or we don't. Now, I, if, if we choose the first option, we don't accept it, then the preparation for this class would have been much easier and making listening to it much shorter. But we need to understand that the role that we fill in God's plan and purpose begins with these fundamentals. First and foremost, we take and accept that the Bible is God's word. So one of these principles is to accept that God exists. So without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's, that's Hebrews 11, verse 6. We have to believe that God exists. And as a follow-up to that, that God will reward those who diligently seek to understand what his will is and to do that will. It's, imper it's a paramount that we seek to understand. Now, another principle, God rules over us. Uh, just a sec, I've clicked the wrong window. There we go. God rules over us. God rules in the kingdom of men. Daniel chapter 4, verses 17, 25, and 32 confirm this to Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest, most powerful human kings of all time, needed to understand that he was subordinate to God. He was a, in a position below God. And this phrase is, is used really to help Nebuchadnezzar understand the place that he held in front of the Almighty King, the Almighty God. Uh, there's another principle. Let's, uh, let's turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll read uh, verses 15 to 17 together. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all of it, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All of scripture, and, and we've, we've done a number of classes on this, where it, it's not convenient for us to read some passages if we take our own mentality or mindset and, and let it be influenced by the, the world around us. All scripture, despite how difficult it may seem, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that it completes us, that it becomes the foundation of what we think and act and believe. So there's one other uh, principle that, we, um, that we're going to look at before we kind of frame the Old Testament, we'll say, in, in terms of this, this issue of sexism. And that actually comes out in in Matthew chapter 5, and it talks about the Old Testament being fulfilled in the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we examine the passages in the Old Testament, we need to understand that Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Matthew 5, verse 17 to 20, do not think, and this is Jesus speaking of himself, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Okay, so we don't have to tear out the Old Testament and throw it away. A lot of uh, churches today will, will print the New Testament and the Psalms, and that's what you get as your Bible. That's not what Jesus is saying by any means. I did not come to destroy the Old Testament, but to fulfill. And this is a foundational principle, brethren and sisters, as we look at some of these issues. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, one jaw or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So is this passage saying that Jesus means we need to go to the Old Testament and fulfill all of the components of the law? It's not. It's actually that in fulfilling the law, the Lord Jesus Christ sets the bar even higher for us. We are no longer bound by each of the individual instructions of the law, but the Lord's life that fulfilled the law actually sets that bar higher. We are now responsible for the law of Christ, and that is the principle of the law. It's more difficult to keep than the law itself. As it says there, you need to exceed the righteousness of the most righteous of all, which was the scribes and Pharisees. So the Old Testament then is a schoolmaster. It helps to bring into focus the problem of sin. And it helps us to bring in our minds to Christ. It's the schoolmaster as described in Galatians chapter 3. And I strategically am going to stop reading at verse 25 because there's a very, very fundamental principle that comes immediately following these verses. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So the law kept us between the fence, po fence posts, so to speak. Keeps us in line, just here's your to-do list, do this, don't do that, okay. But something new comes, and that is faith. Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster or our tutor to what? To bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And so this helps us to frame some of the passages that we find puzzling and difficult in the Old Testament. Uh, the law is extreme in its highlight of sin, and very, very, very brightly shines a light, but it's also an incredible tool to help us to understand how God views sin. Uh, it's with total abhorrence. And so we see then the fulfillment of this law in the Lord Jesus Christ. The law, the prophet, and the Psalms all focus forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that said, let's dig into some of these things. And, and, and the Proverbs actually have a, has a fascinating verse. I, I love this verse because when something's difficult, um, oh, that slide's in the wrong spot. This is the one we want. We want to examine the scriptures. We want to dig into this and find the answers in God's word. And so when we examine the scriptures, Proverbs 25 verse 2 says this, 
It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And brethren and sisters, if we dig into some of these issues, this is why we want to lay these foundation principles that we dig into God's word and find out what it says. One of the things that scripture says is, is hierarchy. There is a very, very clear hierarchy, and this slide is simple. It starts with God. God is supreme. This is God's creation. We are God's, uh, we are God's creatures. Underneath God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And under the Lord Jesus Christ is God's ecclesia. So we have a very, very clear type, a very, very clear hierarchy that God lays out for us that we must come to terms with if we agree that this is the word of God. Very clear. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's ecclesia. And so as we analyze this, it has to be forefront in our mind. How do we interact with God? How do we interact with God's word, his instructions? God being first, his son being second, and, and we are third. And then, therefore, how do we interact with each other? This is key when we look at, at sexism. So it's, it's paramount. Uh, despite how we think and how we might feel and our opinions, we have to look at this outside of the modern context and with a godly lens. So God in his infinite power and, and his wisdom has, has an immense uh, knowledge far beyond what we do. And, and he makes it very, very clear what he, would, he wants us to do. Not just wants us to do, but commands us to do. So we can't let our own, uh, I'll say, lack of in, uh, mental capacity or imagination limit uh, how we perceive God. And it's very clear uh, that God from the beginning had a plan. And material to that plan is the Lord Jesus Christ. Just turn with me to John chapter one. So I'm going to, we won't do too much page flipping uh, at the beginning. And now we're going to start to, to dive into some of the, the words in, uh, in our Bibles. And we're going to have to read them. So first John, or sorry, first John, John one verses one to three. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So Christ is right there from the beginning, core to the plan and purpose of God. So there are types in scripture. Um, this is the key to God's plan. It's, it's his son. He was there at the beginning in, in, in word, in logos, in plan and purpose. And he, of course, is the focus for our own lives. Now, there's another type that comes out uh, in scripture, which is Christ as the bridegroom and the ecclesia as the bride. John chapter 3, John uh, and verse 29, John the Baptist describes Jesus as the bridegroom. Mark 2, verse 19, Jesus refers to his disciples as the friends of the bridegroom. Keep in mind also uh, the, the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins when uh, they're waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom to go into the marriage feast. Uh, and in uh, Revelation 21, verses 2 and verse 9, it describes New Jerusalem as the bride of the Lamb. So the redeemed believers are, are brought as a, as a bride uh, to the Lamb, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have read for, for us Ephesians uh, chapter 5, which also highlights this relationship between man and woman and Christ in the ecclesia. This is a type that we need to develop and is the foundation principle as we consider any passage that we might deem to be sexist. This is the key. This is the, the fulcrum principle, so, so to speak, when we look at sexism in the context of God's word. There is very, very well-defined types that exist that we are to follow and understand. So the type is clear. Christ is the husband, the ecclesia is the bride. So with those things said, let's take a look at some difficult passages. I didn't highlight, you can see I've got uh, seven distinct or, or eight distinct chapters here that I mentioned. What I don't go into here, and we won't have time to even look at all of these, but what we, we want to come to terms with is some of the, the I'll call them the big hitters, the, the highlight passages, so to speak, that, that we need to take a look at and just come to terms with. And, and when you, I hope, exercise this principle of a very, very well-defined type in God's word, when you come across other passages, what I'm going to deal with tonight, you understand one of two things, that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
or this foundation principle of types and hierarchy that God lays out for us very, very clearly also apply. And when you apply that principle, uh, brethren and sisters, it is a very, very personally challenging thing that needs to, uh, we need to come to terms with, not just for women, but for men as well. Very, very challenging when we look at it from the lens of, of God's word, not from understanding what it is that it says and what it means, but our own conduct in relationship to what God is saying for us, uh, for us to do. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at it then is, is, a, is Ephesians chapter 5. So let's dive into uh, uh, Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is a letter that Paul wrote um, to the brethren and sisters that were in the Ephesian Ecclesia to walk worthy, as it says in chapter four, verse one, to walk worthy of the vocation to which they were called. Now, a vocation, as you know, is your job. It's the thing that you, you, you have to do. Here you are, this is your vocation. If you're a carpenter, it means you gotta bang nails and, and build things. Um, if you're an engineer, you, you need to uh, exercise the principles of applied science in the, in the interest of the safety of the public. Uh, accountant, balance the books. These are all of the things that were the vocation that people are called to behave. As a professional engineer, I have a, a code of conduct and ethics that I need to abide by. Um, in order to practice as an engineer. We've got a few engineers in, in our ecclesia that, that, that are familiar with this. There's other codes of conduct that, that people are professionally bound to adhere to. Paul talks about this in the Ephesians. He says there's a vocation, there's work to do, and you need to walk worthy of that vocation. It means to exhibit the behavior and the mind of Christ. So turn with me to Ephesians. We're going to have a look at Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to look at verses two to five. Oops, I've overshot. Back to Ephesians here. Ephesians chapter four, verses two, two to five. How were they to walk worthy of the vocation of the job that they were to do? They were to walk with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're going to read one more verse. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. This is the, the framework that Paul sets before we get to these troubling passages in Ephesians chapter 5. So we have a very, very clear appeal to unity, to mutual submission, to forbearing one another in peace. And we have a reference here in, in the body of Christ in, in verses 11 to 16, the body of Christ that has different parts, which all must work together as a functioning machine. So let's have a look here. Ephesians chapter five uh, starts out with some, some difficult phrases. Um, and, and it's difficult for us to, to understand, but have a look at verses one and two. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There's a key word here, submit. And this is really critical as we understand sexism. It is a responsibility both for men and for women to submit, not only to each other, but to God's word, to, to, uh, to what he's written down for us. Ephesians chapter five, verses 22 to 23. We're not gonna reread that. Brother Jared uh, did a good job of, of walking us through those verses. These verses establish this connection between Christ as the man and the ecclesia as the woman and vice versa. And this is a really, really important type that we need to carry forward as we look at these passages. And one thing that is interesting to do, and we're going to do this in, in a few minutes when we look at another passage, 
is as you read through when we talk about wives and husbands, talk about these uh, or re almost read through these passages, alternating the words with Ecclesia and the Lord Jesus Christ. This helps us to understand and really put into mind what it is that God is, is, is challenging uh, or not challenging, but telling us to be challenged by these things to a very, very high calling that we must uh, do these things. And, and, and verses 22 down to 33 establish this principle of mutual submission. We need to uh, conclude that wives must submit themselves to their husband as the ecclesia commits, submits to Christ. And husbands must love their wives as Christ sacrificed himself for the ecclesia. And so where in scripture is the justification for the uh, Victorian principle of being able to uh, beat your wife with a rod smaller than your thumb? In what sense, in anywhere in scripture, did the Lord Jesus Christ behave in this way? In where, uh, where in scripture, and I need chapter and verse from you, uh, either in the chat right now or in discussion afterwards, where in scripture, chapter and verse, does the Lord Jesus Christ put down women? There's nowhere in scripture where this occurs. However, Christ submitted himself to the will of his father and he died for us that we might have forgiveness of sins. And that brethren and that men is your responsibility, your type, the way you must behave. And sisters, it's clear, you fulfill this type of the ecclesia in the relationship with men, the men, the brethren and sisters in the Ecclesia, as Christ in the Ecclesia in that relationship. So somewhat difficult, but very, very clear. Something else comes out, I think, in, in verse 32, which I think is, is really uh, exciting. And this, I think, is the, the, the focus of this, which is a great mystery that says, I speak concerning Christ and the Ecclesia. So when we read through these verses and we look at these orders that, that Paul lays out for us, remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. These are the things that God has laid out for us. And he speaks specifically about this beautiful type of Christ and the body of believers, which includes both men and women. So we must conclude from this that, that wives submit themselves to their husbands, just like the Ecclesia submits to Christ and Christ loved the Ecclesia and gave himself for it. And so wherever we see the instructions uh, for the roles of men and women, we need to keep this forefront in our mind. We must go to the type of Christ in the Ecclesia. So this principle of mutual submission is clear. Men are the type of Christ. Women are the type of the Ecclesia. And this is the role that God has given, and he asks us to fulfill it. So, Given that framework, we're going to go back to the beginning, uh, go back to Genesis chapter 3. And we have the account in Genesis chapter 3. It's foundational. It's very, very key in, in, our, in our understanding right from baptism classes in Sunday school right to uh, the most aged among us and experienced in the truth. Genesis chapter 3 is absolutely critical to our understanding of the relationship between men and women and God's work of atonement and reconciliation for us. So Genesis chapter 3, turn back there, very, very well-known verses, but we're going to read together 14 to 19. Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to really critically listen as we go through this. Does this focus strictly on the oppression of women, or is there something else that happens? Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 14. And the Lord God this is Yahweh Elohim, said to the serpent, because I was done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And to Adam he said, because you have hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the fruit 
are eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And you will eat her the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it were you taken, and for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So the serpent, the woman, the man, and the ground all receive a curse. Each of the, participate, uh, of the participants in this sin receive a curse. Sin brings a curse. Sin brings a challenge to all of us. It brings a challenge to the woman. So specifically that her desire would be to her husband and he will rule over her. And to Adam, the ground would be cursed. Why? Because of him. And he would labor in sorrow to exist, to eat. So then we have a struggle for both men and women. And if we take that type of Christ in the Ecclesia, we have a struggle for Christ and the Ecclesia. And we have here in these verses, looking forward from this time, really till the return of Christ, when Christ uh, will, will set up his kingdom or God's kingdom on this earth, this is the struggle. This is the struggle that we will undergo. So the woman, if we take this type, is she in a position of inferiority to the man? No. Is she in a position of submission? Yes. That's what the scriptures say. Now, specifically, when we apply the type and we read this to the Ecclesia, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and the, thy conception and sorrow will you bring for children and your desire will be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ will rule over you, Ecclesia. So what is it that the tasks of the, of the, of, uh, the Ecclesia is to bring forth children in, in, in pain? Well, sometimes our children cause pain. For those of you that are parents, you might have experienced this. For those of you uh, that aren't parents, trust me, it happens. Um, but the Ecclesia is tasked, as the woman was, with the challenge of raising godly seed. Um, we are to grow and build God's Ecclesia, God's Ecclesia in Cambridge, God's Ecclesia throughout the world. We are challenged to grow and build as the Ecclesia in this way. And the man is to rule over the woman just as Christ did for the Ecclesia in complete self-sacrifice, working constantly, working by the sweat of the brow to build up and ultimately to be prepared to give his life. So this is the type that occurs in Genesis chapter 3. And if we read on in verse 21, we have now the institution of God's atonement, God's reconciling work to bring us back to him. And we see here the man and the woman as the ecclesia. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife coats of skins and clothed them. So now the ecclesia, this man and the woman, are covered. They are covered in tight by the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you have the initiation between the struggle of sin and righteousness, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And you have the institution of God's reconciling work where he's bringing us back to him on his terms because he loves us and he wants us to live the types that he's laid out for us. It shows this purpose of God right here in Genesis, which is fascinating as we see these types uh, continue to be threaded through scripture. And, and really it should encourage us and, and excite us as we see these things uh, coming out in God's word. So the next passage we're going to look at is in 1 Corinthians, and, and this is where um, we see these types continued, specifically around the covering that the Lord Jesus Christ provides. So let's have a look. When we re read the Corinthian, uh, the letters to the Corinthians, specifically the 1 Corinthian letter that Paul wrote, uh, we have Ecclesia in chaos. Uh, we, this is an ecclesia. You think of some of the challenges that we've gone through as an ecclesia and, and maybe some of the challenges that you've seen in ecclesias around us. The Corinthian ecclesia was in complete chaos. Uh, there was gross immoral misconduct. 
Uh, there was ecclesi ecclesial members suing each other. There was terrible idolatry. There was fighting and conflict over who was the most important. There was massive inequality uh, in, in wealth, and it was displayed completely inappropriately at the breaking of bread where people were eating and having feasts. And, and it says, Paul says, and you're getting drunk at ecclesial meetings, specifically the breaking of bread. There's more. This is an ecclesia in chaos. It's not a good scene. And so when we read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he's not speaking nicely and kindly. He's digging at the core of the problem in the Corinthian ecclesia, which is what? It's not sexism. It's, it's not any of the isms that we might face today. It's the problem of the flesh. It's the problem of sin. And what Paul is going through very, very carefully in the Corinthians is he's pointing out to so many of the brethren and sisters the things that they needed to correct. They needed to put aside the works of the flesh and start to bear the, the, the fruits of, of righteousness. So 1 Corinthians 11 and the first 16 verses, we're not going to read, but it goes through a, a very, very careful instruction. It starts off, and this is the key as we read through 1 Corinthians. Again, understanding that Paul wrote God's word. He, he, these are God-breathed words. And he says, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So if we see Paul's example, we know that Paul, although imperfectly, did the will of the Lord Jesus Christ and our creator, our heavenly father. So what Paul says in these verses uh, are clear. Verse three, the type that we have been discussing, it's confirmed. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. You recall slides right at the beginning of our, our, our evening. One, two, three. God, Christ, the ecclesia. And we are to fit our lives into this hierarchy in the way that we think and the way that we behave. Very, very clearly stated here. We are followers of Paul as he was of Christ. And Christ, as it says at the end of verse three, Christ, the head of Christ, is God, our creator, our sustainer of life, our heavenly father. And so the type is confirmed here. We're going to read from verses 7 down to 12. For a man indeed not to have, uh, not ought to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of, of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power or a sign of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things are of God. So Paul here explains why women wear head coverings, why women were to pray and approach God with their head covered. Go back to Genesis chapter three. The symbol is, is very, very clear. It is the symbol of the covering that God provided for the ecclesia in the sacrifice of his son. That's the reason why we wear head coverings. That's the reason why we have an object lesson every time we get together as an ecclesia, that the sisters cover their heads. It's not because they're under oppression. It's not because it's a, an ancient law that means nothing. No, it's actually the type. It's a physical outworking that we can manifest today of the covering that was provided for us in Genesis chapter three by God. The sacrifice of his son, covers the ecclesia. And so when we run these types forward, we see that all of these things start to make sense. They link together. And in fact, they're very, very intuitive as we rationally consider the word of God. The head covering is that physical reminder that Christ died for us, us, his ecclesia, his bride, men and women in that ecclesia, that body of Christ. And note, Christ is not without the ecclesia and the ecclesia is not without Christ and neither is without God. So continuing in 1 Corinthians, there's a, there's a few uh, 
few other passages that we're going to look at. And when you turn over to uh, chapter 14, and it's been interesting, we've been going through this in, in our third portion reading over the last couple of weeks. Paul continues to uh, instruct the Corinthian Ecclesia on a number of things, not just this gross misconduct and all the sin that was going on, but he also instructs them on how to conduct their meetings. Very specifically, this is what you need to do. Chaos. Remember that is the context of the Corinthian Ecclesia. Brethren, sisters, this is how you conduct yourself in an ecclesia. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thanks for, for, for helping us uh, get through this. One of the issues that was happening was around speaking in tongues and prophecy. It also talks about how the women were to behave inside this framework of the, the ecclesial meetings when the, the brothers and sisters were together. Chapter 14 is immediately preceded by a chapter widely recognized as the chapter of love. So we have sandwiched this chapter 14 between a chapter on love in chapter 13 and a chapter on the resurrection, the hope that we, are, we have in chapter 15, the hope of the resurrection where we be raised to incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality and this corruptible put on incorruption. So this is the sandwich we have is chapter 14. And this chapter is about speaking in tongues. It's about prophesying. It's about the way women uh, work inside that framework. Again, don't pick and choose here. If you look at the way Paul uh, speaks very, very clearly, he tells not just the women to be quiet, but those who were speaking in tongues with no interpreter. So this is a letter that when we separate ourselves from the, the modern thinking that we're influenced by now, it helps us to understand some of the challenges that the society that the Corinthians were living in was, was, causing, uh, was causing problems for them. So he doesn't just focus on the instruction for women, and, and you don't have all of the letter to the Corinthian focused in on, on four or five verses saying, oh, this, this verse is all about the oppression of women. This letter is about suppressing the flesh. It's about putting aside humanism, and it's about compliance with what the order and laws that God has laid out for us. Paul tells those that speak in tongues, as I mentioned already, if there's no one there to interpret, he says, don't say anything. There's actually something really fascinating before we analyze these verses, and it's a really, really powerful uh, lesson to us. 1 Corinthians 14, and this is in context of, of the chaos that was occurring in their meetings. Verse 19. Yet, in the ecclesia, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might instruct others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Flip back a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I would like to bring you to verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Five words, Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the point of the Corinthians. It's not a lot of show. It's not a lot about individuals. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Simple concepts, very, very elegant, but very, very powerful. Come back to 1 Corinthians 14 with me, and we're going to read verses 34 to 37. And this is the problematic, challenging um, verses in, in this particular chapter. Let your women keep silence in the ecclesias, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the ecclesia. What? Came the word of God out of you, or came it unto you only? So those are difficult, uh, those, those are difficult verses. Verse 37. If a man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commands of the Lord. So how do we rectify? How do we understand these verses? 
Paul's instructions are for order in the Corinthian Ecclesia. Look at verse 40. The reason this chapter is written is very, very clear. Let all things be done decently and in order. These things are the commands of God. So let's be reminded of the type that we've established. And Paul is instructing here on the Ecclesia how to order their meetings. It's an order appointed by God. And I think these are the most difficult verses to apply in our Ecclesia today. I think the head coverings, it's, it's simple. It, it, when sisters wear head coverings, it's an amazing case study of, of, or, or a visual study and, and demonstration of the covering that is provided the Ecclesia in Christ. But this is a little more difficult. And I would submit to you that these verses are talking about teaching. Um, I think it's, it's the context that is about instruction. We have prophecy, we have speaking in tongues, and that's what this whole chapter is all about. And so specifically what Paul is asking women to do is not to teach, but to be quiet, just like those other people who spoke in tongues and take the appropriate time to discuss. Now, I think in our own ecclesia, we are an ecclesial family. We are one in Christ. And I think in our own ecclesia, there's no reason for women to be silent in terms of question and discussion. But I think this is actually talking about teaching. That word speak is Greek word 2980, and it means to tell or to preach. And I think that that's what Paul is talking about here. I also think that this is in the context of a chaotic meeting where people are yelling back and forth and speaking over each other without any order. But with respect to questions and, and discussions in the ecclesia, I think the principle is clear. We're an ecclesial family. When we meet together, there's time for discussion and questions from all. But we have a very, very specific instruction from Paul that is the command of God for us to comply with the types and the orders that he set out. So one last passage we're going to look at before we wrap up. Let me just do a quick time check. Look at that. I'm right at the wire. So my timing is perfect. And what we're going to do is look at 1 Timothy 2 and verses 11 to 15. And I mentioned we can read sometimes scripture when it's challenging to us and insert the, the type as we read through. And I think we're not going to do any deep dives into 1 first, uh, first Timothy. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2. I see that I did not put the decimal 2 or the numeral 2 after the word Timothy. But this is 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 11 to 15 with a replacement word. And I'd like you to think about this as, as we go through this. Let the ecclesia learn in silence with all submission. Remember what was written about the, the Corinthians. Stop yelling over each other and, and trying to bring attention to yourself for all of us. Let the ecclesia learn in silence with all submission. I don't permit the ecclesia to teach or to have authority over the Lord Jesus Christ, to be, but to be in silence. For Christ was formed first, and then the ecclesia. Think of John chapter 1, verse 14. And Christ was not deceived, but the ecclesia, being deceived, fell into transgression. Genesis chapter 3. Nevertheless, the ecclesia will be saved in childbearing, the ecclesia bringing forth a godly seed, if the ecclesia continues in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So I thought we'd just do that in the First Timothy passage here because it helps us to apply these principles, this order, this structure, these types, and the hierarchy that God has laid out for us. That might be an easy way to kind of come to terms with how these verses that are challenging to us might be dealt with. So I think it makes it a little more clear when we, we approach it, not so much with our, our modern Western humanistic influence lens, but rather from the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ and our creator, our heavenly father. Now there's some other passages. We're not going to look at them tonight, like Colossians three uh, and first Peter one and two, where it talks about women as the weaker vessels. That's a fascinating study. The first thing you need to do is look at what vessels are. And as you study that, it's, it's fascinating what comes out. You have the ecclesia as a weaker vessel. Mm, fascinating study. I'm not going to look at those tonight because we need to move on and really discuss submission. Submission is the principle that guides us. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8, and we'll read those passages because this talks about 
our head, the ecclesia's head, not, not a man or a woman, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, brethren and sisters, is very telling. We're going to look at two passages here that talk about this principle of submission. If we are unable to submit our will to God's, unfortunately, we cannot be part of the promises that God has made to us. So look at verse five. And these are very, very, again, very, very well-known verses. We're trying to refresh these principles in our mind and, and build this as a foundation to be able to ask these questions. Philippians chapter two, verse five. Let this mind be in you, in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a king. Oh, wait, no. The form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we can continue on. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and giving him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Jesus humbled himself. He submitted to God's will. So brethren, humble yourself, humble myself, submit to others. Sisters, your responsibility is the same. If Christ can submit to God's will, my king can submit to God's will, I certainly must be able to do the same. Matthew 26, verse 38 to, to 42, I think gives us an amazing picture into the mind of Christ as he struggled with this very thing that you and I do. It's succinctly summarized. And Christ says, not as I will, but as you will. And this principle of submission, brethren and sisters, is key for us to understanding God's word. And it's key to, for us to understanding how the world views the, the words in scripture, the divinely written words for, for us, recorded for us, ordered divinely, that appear with the Western lens to be sexist. So let's make some conclusions. We can't examine this or really any other difficult topic in scripture from what societal lens. It's not my opinion, man. It's not how I feel. No. We examine this from God's perspective. And we examine this from the perspective that all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and so on. This must be analyzed from a godly perspective with godly types and scriptural types. God is supreme. We must submit to his will if we, if we desire to be part of that plan and purpose that he has for us. Um, the Bible describes spiritual types, uh, and these are the spiritual types that we need to apply in our lives. Christ is our head. We as an ecclesia are his bride. And inside that framework of the ecclesia, men are to live the type of Christ, and women are to live the type of the ecclesia. So our high calling is to manifest the fruits of the spirit and to submit to the will of our heavenly father. And that brother and sisters is completely counterintuitive to everything that the world is telling us to do. Everything that the world is telling us to do is to fulfill self. And God is asking us and through his amazing work of reconciliation to bring him, bring us back to him, to, to the amazing work of the atonement, in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's asking us to submit to the things that he's written down for us to do. So is the Bible sexist? No, it's not. It's an amazing type of God's reconciling work. Do people act badly? Do people act in a way that is sinful? Yeah, unfortunately. Does God's word test us, challenge us, form us into a shape that he wants? Absolutely, there's no question. And what our struggle is, is to fight our incongruent, natural selfishness to comply with the things that God has laid out for us. 
And now's when we'll conclude with the, the words of, of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise.